We're going to move on to J.W. Anderson, which to me personally was one of the most interesting collections of Milan Fashion Week. Now, I feel like J.W. Anderson kind of always transports you into these kind of like dream worlds. It's something that he's always done. And there's always like this surrealist sort of new age energy to it. And I think at Loewe, he sort of channels the same energy. But I think at J.W. Anderson, it's a bit more wild and a bit more experimental, where in, I feel like in Loewe, what he does at Loewe, it's a bit more refined, but there are still elements of, you know, the surrealist aesthetic and ideas coming through. So this collection, very, very interesting. I'm going to show you some stuff on the screen because it's very, very relevant to the collection. So this is a type of pottery slash company called Cornish Ware. Now, Cornish Ware, this like stripy pottery in a way, is like basically a type of ceramics design. It's very British where you have these blue stripes across pottery. Now, this pottery was actually um, created by a British potter called, I think, T.G. Green. And some, they've kind of developed these ideas over the years. And now you find colors like this, like green, red, yellow, alongside the blue. But the original is the blue. And for this collection, they actually had a collaboration with J.W. Anderson, which was really cool. So they had different mugs and different pots and different stuff that J.W. Anderson, like teapots that J.W. Anderson gave as the invitations to the runway shows, which I thought was really, really interesting. And I feel like because Z.W. Anderson is always kind of infusing ideas of Britishness in every single collection. And so it's just the most British thing <laughs> to kind of reintroduce people to Cornish wear because Cornish wear is one of those things that is so distinctively British. Like it's such a staple. It just reminds me of like really old, like rich British people that love British culture and want like bespoke pottery that kind of buy into Cornish wear. Um, and there's a really amazing article about this, this whole story of the Cornish wear and J.W. Anderson on the Financial Times, because he was, th in the interview, he was talking about how him and Rebecca Rickards, who is kind of like one of the main people of the Cornish wear brand, her dad was actually one of the investors that revitalized the company before it died in, 2007 because it was under threat of closure so her and her team kind of worked with jw anderson and made over like 500 teapots mugs siri on pasta bowls for the invitations of the show and she was just really happy at like how much press it brought to the cornish wear brand and also just the fact that she saw young people interested in something that is very associated with 30 year olds and older so I just thought that was really interesting that J.W. Anderson, I feel like every collection that I see of his, there's always this sort of reintroduction to something British that was kind of old and is kind of forgotten. So I just like those aspects to things. <laughs> there, there are some brands where I love to see the budget for the runway show invitations. Teapots are not cheap. Yeah. <laughs> it would be so expensive to make these. Like I can imagine. And I just want to say a quote from the Financial Times article um, where Rebecca Rickards was talking about the impact of sort of this collaboration with J.W. Anderson. So she said, it was lovely seeing Cornish wear step into the world of fashion, which it's never done before. And it was wild to see bloggers and influencers dressed in blue and white stripes. You realize that the power of the Cornish wear brand had filtered through. Then to quote what J.W. Anderson said about this, it says, Cornish ware is a British household classic, a ceramic that any person would have in their home. And of course, like I said earlier, it's kind of like something that was really huge and it's kind of forgotten. So yeah, it was just really cool that J.W. Anderson was, you know, reintroducing these things because Cornish ware was something that came, I think, in the 1920s. So it is quite old. It is very, very old. Very, very nostalgic, like, uh, Maxi said, extremely nostalgic.
<laughs> remember when Balenciaga were giving out those iPhones to show invitations even if they were broken it's still worth 50 to 100 pounds minimum yeah good point to kind of go through the idea like the general idea of this collection really what this collection was about was about elevating everyday clothes textures structures patterns items that are typically seen in a British home so that's why in this collection you have kind of like rugby polo shirts, but they're made super thick and the waists are kind of cinched in weirdly in this sort of humorous way that J.W. Anderson likes to do things. That was one of the elements. You see different knitted fabrics because J.W. Anderson was talking about how, you know, knitwear is a big craze and a lot of people are obsessed with knitwear now. So he literally just made a, a look that was just knitted balls you have a lot of fabrics, like this shirt, for example. And a lot of the shirts had this kind of like deep V cut. Um, but they're, some of the fabrics were inspired by just like fabrics you see around the home or fabrics that you see around the studio. I also find it really interesting because once again, I said his collections always have this surrealist vibe, how most of the garments had this like excess fabric to the side. It's kind of interesting. I wonder if anyone's actually going to buy that. This dress is something that he's done before. This dress is like the idea of like when wind blows a, a dress sideways, kind of what it would look when wind blows your dress upwards and to the side. I kind of like the idea. It's just funny. This rugby shirt here is a twist on the Cornish wear. It's kind of like a reversal, making sure that there's more blue than white. Even when you look at the set also, the set has a blue stripe through the set and that is kind of like, a reference to Cornish wear. That's why it's like blue and white stripes. He said instead of Janssen goes too hard. He has some really sick pieces. Yeah, I agree. <laughs> Not the teapot sh <laughs> The teapot shorts. That's hilarious. <laughs> I really love this, by the way. The collarless shirts that are super, super cropped. It's kind of like silhouette-wise, we're also going into Prada territory again with the elongated sleeves. Um, but I find it really interesting that he's kind of, once again, taking everyday basics, everyday things that you would see in a British home and just completely transforming them, like taking knitted pieces and just making them a bit more interesting. Like, I just think that J.W. Anderson is so interesting. Like, his, his way of thinking really interests me. And I like the way that he transforms things. Doesn't make for the most wearable things. And I don't know how J.W. Anderson does commercially. Of course, he has some very iconic bags, like the Pierce bag. Um, so that's probably going to make all the money for the brand anyway. But just looking at what he does as, as an artist, it really, really fascinates me. J.W. Anderson is one of those brands where I'm looking at the pieces and I've learned there's no point trying to guess slash assume what material things are made of. Just wait to see it in person to find out. Yeah, good point. Good point. I also like the footwear, by the way. These, like, elevated clog vibe going on. I really like it. Like, he just makes things so interesting. Like, even if you look at the way that hoodie was moving, it was so interesting. <laughs> also, these kind of pieces, by the way, they look like... um kind of like a mat that you have in the shower. But J.W. Anderson said that a lot of those pieces were actually inspired. Like when I first saw them, before like learning about the, the collection and reading the interviews, I thought it was like a reference to bathroom mats. But J.W. Anderson said there's actually just some 70s, a sofa from the 70s that's in his office. So it's inspired by that. Um, and kind of like, I like that he had these interlocking knitted pieces because they genuinely look like the kind of pieces that people knit themselves at home. And then obviously the other pieces that have just balls of wool as the shirt. And I feel like it'll be even more interesting if the same balls of wool that he used in those tops were the same balls of wool used to actually make those knitted pieces. That would be like big brain. That would be serious big brain. We've got some more windblown dresses. <laughs> Jada is probably topping up the company books with that low FA check. 
Yeah, yeah. Um, someone said I like knitwear pieces. Majority of this collection was actually a lot of knitwear. Um, this this collection is very knitwear heavy, actually. So here we have J.W. Anson playing with a vest, kind of just adding random bits of fabric to it. Yeah, so these are the pieces I'm talking about. So it's literally just the shirt that's actually just balls of wool. It would be so interesting if this top, those balls of wool were the same. I need to actually look into it to see if the same colors used in these balls of wool are the same colors of the knitted interlocking shirts. That's big brain. These pieces here are a reference to mop heads. So he's literally made shirts inspired by mop heads, which again is in, this, in the theme of transforming everyday clothes and things that you typically see in a British home. Yeah, this, I agree, he is good. He uses his shows for ideas, but he's ready to wear in stores as solid good knitwear. Yeah, I think most of the pieces I actually see that make it to stores are just the bags, the shoes, and kind of like, you know, the, the printed tops that just say J.W. Anderson. And of course, J.W. Anderson makes a lot of money doing different things. Like, he has the ongoing collaboration with Uniqlo. I own a few J.W. Anderson Uniqlo shirts, actually. Um, and then... Recently, I can't remember what exactly, but I know there's a new collection. I think it's a sportswear collection that he's making with Uniqlo, like an activewear collection. So that's one way that the brand is doing well commercially. <laughs> Are mops British? I don't, I don't know where mops originate from, to be honest. They're just something that you'd see in a typical household. That's all. I also like this silhouette of like skirts with the excessive fabric. Like, there's so much fabric on the skirts that it pulls the skirt, the dress down, which I find really, really fascinating. Even these shirts were just an added fabric panel. It just adds an extra, you know, element to the shirts. Ah, uh, yeah, there we go. A tennis one with a tennis player. Yes, Roger Federer. There we go. Yeah. But yeah, this collection was, to me personally, one of the standouts. Maybe not the most commercial, maybe not the most wearable, like I've said earlier. But in terms of like intrigue, the fact that he's playing with so many different ideas, it's fun, it's funny. Everything he does is like quite comical. There is this like funky sense of humor that he has to his work. It's fun, it's playful. But you look at the collection, you see a lot of things that will sell. Like if you look at the bags, Almost every look comes with a bag. I feel like these um, leather clogs are actually going to be a hit because they look really nice. I like the silhouette of them. There are also other like knitted footwear bits in the collection. There's some nice knitwear that's quite wearable. So I like the balance that J.W. Anderson has in his collections where he can show some really, really artistic things that probably no one is going to wear, no buyer is going to buy. But at the same time, he can mix and match that with things that would work well in a store and would actually work well commercially. I think I think that's the perfect balance. Yeah, it was executed really well. Like even these rugby shirts, yes, it's a play on like typical rugby polos, but they're just ultra, ultra thick rugby polos. And I think it adds structure to it, which I really like. Also these pinstripe looks, this is something that J.D.R. Anderson has done before. I think... There's um, there's it's a reference to also these like pinstripe fabrics in his studio, but it's something he's worked with before. Like he's had this kind of excessive fabric and panelled pinstripe looks. Here we've got some more mop, mop pieces going on. A tiny J.W. Anderson bag. I find a woman's wear more commercial though, less about ideas them pieces ready to wear and styled in a less extreme way yeah i mean obviously this collection is co-ed even though i i personally think that all of fashion is unisex if you are to ask me um so i don't really care about what like obviously this is the men's wear season but i've never personally cared about if it's a men's wear show or a women's wear show it's co-ed or whatever i just look at the 
clothes being presented. Um, and obviously, I understand that majority of people in the world don't see all clothes as unisex. Um, like most men would not be seen dead wearing a shirt that was marketed to women, which is kind of funny. Um, but yeah, it's kind of interesting how there's a more commercial theme going on with the women's looks versus the men's looks, which some of them are styled a bit crazy. <laughs> the collection screams brunch at 2 p.m. <laughs> I feel like I missed the look. One of my favorite looks. Oh yeah, that's Ed Aubrey Anderson wearing um a rugby jersey, which is really cool because um that was a reference to his dad. His dad was actually a rugby player, a rugby international player for Ireland, if you guys didn't know. Um his dad is actually like a really famous rugby player. And he's uh still a rugby coach right now, actually. Last time I checked. Um, which is really cool. Cause I think that um rugby jersey is also unreleased which is cool because he kind of like in a way launched slash unveiled the new kit to fashion. That was a really cool moment. And J.W. Anderson said in an interview that the reason why he wore that to kind of, you know, kind of like in memory of, well, not in memory because it's not like he's dead, but like just to say thank you to his dad is because it was Father's Day. It's kind of cute. It's kind of cute. Here are some more like detailed shots of the collection kind of like the deep v-cut hoodies i've noticed across a lot of collections this season as well there are a lot of like v-cut silhouette things going on like prada did it jw anderson did it a lot of brands were doing the v-cuts i just find it so weird that every season there's things that every brand does that that's really similar like this season it was a lot of brands doing the super short shorts and the V-cuts, like a lot of brands doing it. I always wonder, do brands like contact each other and they're like, okay, you can have all your ideas that you want, but we need to collectively have these really short shorts and we need to make sure that everyone has a deep V-cut in their collection. Like I always wonder, is this like some collective thing going on? Like what is actually going on here? <laughs> this collection screams gooseberry and cinnamon yogurt. <laughs> I love this piece, by the way. This piece is kind of like a, from the collection, kind of like a worn-in leather coat, which, or it could even be um, like a reference to worn-in leather furniture that would be in the house. But I just like kind of how the leather looks worn in. It's just kind of nice. This is the... The wall shirt. What are we calling the shirt, guys? What What's the name? What name are we giving this? The shirt made of just balls of wool. So what do you guys think about the collection in total? Micah, if you're free, actually, um, hop into the live because I want to know your thoughts about this and, of course, the Prada collection. <laughs> the yarn shirt. I love that. I love that. But yeah, I think in terms of like what interested me, I think this collection definitely interested me the most of all the collections this season. I thought it was actually the most interesting um, of the bunch. These are just like a look on some of the bags. And this is where I say once again, J.W. Anderson has the perfect balance because these bags are going to sell like hotcakes. Like, I already know they're going to... Like, JW Anton bags sell anyway. Um, these shoes, if they're comfortable, I'm not going to lie, I can see myself wearing these. Like, with some wide trousers that sit nicely on the... Yeah. Yeah. Maybe not the pink colour. <laughs> the brown, that's, that's all me right there. This colour, that's me. Black. I just need to figure out if they're comfortable or not, because sometimes... A lot of fashion things look sensational aesthetically, but you wear them and your feet start bleeding, literally. <laughs> Some more looks. I like, I just love how exaggerated that like excess leather panel 
looks on the shorts. And also the hems are raw. Just so interesting. So, so interesting. These are some of the more knitted pieces. Hello there, Mr. December. Yo, I only tap in for a bit. I'm doing my taxes. So oh. I was just, I had you up on the side and I was sorting transactions. Good luck with that, bro. Yeah, long day, bro. Long day. <laughs> yeah. I like this collection. It's not my favorite JW Anderson collection, but I like it a lot. Why? Do you like the playfulness of it or is it? Yeah. What I is think, it? No, I've always been, um, I've been saying this for a while, actually. I've always been really um, attracted to things that are, like, inherently British. Something mm. about them, like, really intrigued me. So that's why I love, like, Martine Rose. Um, so a collection like this is going to capture me, like, quite quickly. Just because, like, right. you feel more attached to it, I guess, than, like, when we're looking at certain American designers making references to, yeah, maybe pop culture that I'm familiar with. But it's not really something that I'm nostalgic about. It's more right. something I'm familiar with. You get what I mean? Yeah. But um, no, nah, I also I I think those rugby shirts are knitted, right? They look like it anyway. If they look knitted, but I never I won't know because I that obviously I didn't bad. cover the show, so I wasn't but up close to the clothing. I think, uh, they look cool to me anyway. It looks cool. But yes, just, it's hard uh, to know really what any fabric is looking at pictures in a runway video. Unless yeah, you're nowadays, like up close. I feel like it only got like that as of like four years ago, three years ago. Yes, because all these designers like <laughs> doing this optical illusion crap. Yeah. Uh, how do you say it? Trombio or whatever it's Trump called. Trombio or however French people say <laughs> it. said, oh, it's leather. It's, uh, it's silk. <laughs> Meanwhile, it looks like leather, but it's actually <laughs> denim. Yeah. It looks like denim, but it's actually leather. No, it's a cool collection though. Um, I think as well, if if I remember correctly, J.W. Anderson's quite good at like um, watering down runway pieces into ready-to-wear pieces in the store. So like, 100%. it won't quite be the same as the runway, but it will be like very similar in a lot of ways, but a lot, but still quite wearable. Do you think that comes down to just styling? Like he styles things more extremely in the runway and then pairs it back, or is it? No, also no, kind of like make, a curation make, of what it's either at JW Anderson or at Loewe. I can't remember. Either way, it's it's under JW Anderson that happens a lot. But it's mm -hmm. like they just make the pieces different. Um, most brands do it anyway, to be honest. Yeah, but yeah of like, course. But when it's like stuff like this, where like the mop stuff, for example, I'm sure they'll find a clever way to like make it a lot more wearable once it hits the stores. Yeah, I mean, kind of like for context for the audience, in case you're unaware, like when you go to the showroom of most brands, I feel like a lot of people just think the buyers are going to see just what they've seen on the runway. Like showrooms are vast. So especially with bigger brands, you'll see the looks from the runway, but also like pared down looks of things on the runway. Sometimes you might see stuff that didn't even go on the runway, like permanent collection stuff in the yeah. showroom. Like, there's a big variety of things that buyers buy. That's why a lot of the time, like, you'll see a, a store buy things, and, like, none of this was even on the runway, but that's because in the mm. showroom, like, yeah, they yeah. had all this permanent and, and it goes stuff. Vice versa as well. A lot of the stuff on the runway have no intention of being mass-produced for exactly. uh, consumers. Because remember as well, like, a runway is a display of what a house can do. Obviously, the highest level of that is couture. But, like, if you're not a couturier house, like, the, the a runway is a display of what you're capable of. It doesn't mean, oh, we're going to sell this. It just means this is what we can do in this season if we want. Like, yeah. this, this is what we want to show you guys. Yeah, 100%. What did you think of the Prada collection? I didn't care for it. But I, know, I, I never do. I never do. So. <laughs> why do you... <laughs> why, why didn't you care for it? In fact, I don't think I even read the show notes. Because I saw the collection, I was like, I don't want to. I don't care. I mean, the show notes are... They are what they are. It's um very complicated ways of saying very, very basic things, as designers like to do. I feel like no, they you feel know, like using big words. Sometimes you read the words. show notes and you feel enlightened. But like... Well, if you read Rick's show notes, you feel very enlightened. Mm. Um... It just depends on the designer. Prada normally is a lot of jargon. And it's just like, okay, so you're basically explaining to us that you've taken a silhouette of a shirt and you've transformed it many different ways. And then you've used all these words like architecture and structure and, <laughs> and around the body to kind of just describe that. Um, 
It's just what they do. This JW Anderson footwear is good, man. I think it'll sell well. The footwear is really good. Yeah, that's what I was saying. I just need to make sure they're comfortable. That's all. Footwear is good. Because, um, yeah, high oh, fashion cool. shoes, comfortability. Maxi, Maxi mentioned Birkenstock. Have you seen all that stuff um, about Birkenstock at the moment? About how um, oh, no. go public. Really? Birkenstock are potentially going to go public for the first time, like, ever. And well, it, it, I guess it, they want to raise funds and then become yeah, a billion but dollar brand. Like, um, it's valued at like four billion or something ridiculous. Already, like so why yeah. are they going to go public then? More money, I guess. Apparently, it was bought for like two billion a few years back, mm -hmm. and then um, before they go public, people are guesstimating that it's it's valued at around four billion, and that's what they think it will it will settle up. Interesting. But it's quite mad when you think about it. Because I feel like Birkenstocks are really in right now. And a lot of brands, high fashion brands, are making like Birkenstock equivalents, if not just straight up collaborating. And collabs, like Rick yeah, Owens like your, with them, Dior. Your... Yeah. But I feel like people who aren't collabing with them are just making their own alternative. Which yeah, is, true. I guess, kind of what we're seeing here. I mean, I, I could see some of these shoes, people trying to decide between a Birkenstock and these. Even, like, I feel like in menswear now, there's, like, a clogs trend going on. Yeah, and yeah. That definitely. is kind of the Birkenstocks effect. Mm, definitely. Like, everyone has some sort of clog slash mule that they mm. have. Even, like, Martin Rose has her mule. And yeah, like yeah. Everyone has, like, their version. I think that is definitely, like, the Birkenstocks effect. Mm. But, yeah, I didn't... Yeah, this shirt is so nice. Go back one. Uh, to 108. Oh, yeah, it's hard. Yeah, the rugby shirt. Super, super structured rugby shirt. That's hard. I like that a lot. Will you be buying any of the collection, sir? Funny enough, JW Anderson is one of those brands that uh, I don't think I've ever bought directly from the brand. Yeah, I think the only pieces I have are the Uniqlo ones. Yeah, you know the, the, the um, panel shirts I have, like the blue one and the grey one? Yeah, yeah, yeah. Yeah, those are JW Anderson, Unico. Mm -hmm. No, the the Unico clubs have been really big. Though. I feel like, was JW Anderson the first one that got, like, big back in, like, 2016? Have I made that up? I feel like the first JW Anderson Unico club was the first Unico club where, where I was seeing it everywhere and, like, people are really talking about it, like, oh, Unico, yeah. Unico. So there's been, like, big ones, like, even, um, I feel like... Uh... What's her name? Jill Sander. Was that not her? Collab. It, well, she's had other collabs like way before. There was uh -huh. a recent one, but she's had some like years and years ago. Um, I feel like her collabs always like a lot of people talk about yeah. them. I think a lot of fashion um, people, so yeah. fashion people come out the woodwork for the Jill Sander ones. But I feel like more, less fashion people are interested in uh, the JW Anderson ones. Like a lot of like people who don't consider themselves fashion guys are still interested. 